Good evening, everyone. It's really great to see all of you this evening, and I, I, I know that um, it is uh, tough to compete with the final race of the Little Brown Jug. <laughs> but you know, when you have a Smith Civil War lecture, that's an easy call. And I am thrilled to see all of you and to welcome you to campus and to welcome you to this lecture. And to be able to gather in this way without uh, uh, the limitations that have made it more difficult the last couple of years. Uh, to be together, uh, to share uh, the intellectual stimulation of the lecture, uh, the intellectual stimulation and the social interaction of the conversations both before and after. Uh, to bring together both students of Ohio Wesleyan today and students across the decades who studied at the feet of Professor Richard Smith. I'd like to just uh, find out who we have in the room tonight. If you were a student of Dick Smith, would you stand? Wow, look at that. It always inspires me the number of former students of Dr. Smith who uh, returned to campus for this lecture, many crossing state lines, uh, some coming at great distance, many academics who have uh, followed uh, in Dr. Smith's footsteps, uh, receiving PhDs and pursuing careers in the academy, becoming teachers and scholars um, in the lineage of Dr. Smith, uh, what uh, in athletic circles they call the coaching tree. Uh, here we have the academic tree with us this evening with so many people uh, who have, at the inspiration of Dick Smith, uh, moved on uh, into, into the work in the academy. Of course, it's a special treat to have Dick and Betty with us. Dick and Betty, would you just wave so that we can welcome you and say thank you for your loyalty and your service and your impact on all of us. Well, I could keep talking, but we have far more interesting things to hear about this evening. So at this point, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Barbara Turgeon uh, to introduce our speaker and to share just a bit more about the evening that is before us. Barbara? So decided it was a little too risky to take those two steps up, and so I'm going to speak from here. Um, on behalf of the History Department, welcome very much. On, on Monday night, we had our first in-person faculty meeting since pre-COVID. And at that meeting, Rock wanted to tell the faculty that two alums had made, independently, had made significant donations to Ohio Wesleyan and that their motivation to do so was because of the fantastic education they received from individual professors that had shaped their lives. And so indeed, we are here tonight because of that exact thing. Uh, Richard W. Smith, Dick Smith, had an extraordinary influence on students while he was here teaching. So much so that in 2002, the inaugural Richard W. Smith Civil War Lecture took place here with James McPherson being that first speaker. And here we are, 2022. Now, one of the things I looked up in terms of Professor Janey speaking tonight is that in 2003, Gary Gallagher. I mean, year after year, these were nationally known, extraordinary scholars, historians who spoke. Well, you know your, your lecture series has matured when 19 years later, our superstar, nationally recognized historian is the graduate student of Gary Gallagher. So more on that in, in just a moment. But r seriously, um, Dick and Betty, they changed so many lives. And um, 18, I think, PhD students. But uh, you didn't have to go on and get a PhD in history in any other field. Uh, Evan Corns, for example, went off and made a lot of money. But he loved his history classes, the classic liberal arts. So in any event, thank you, Dick. Betty for being such an inspiration, and thank you to the donors of this lecture series. 
so having said that, James McPherson, Gary Gallagher, uh, you know, the list of people who came and spoke here, uh, you know, top-notch historians uh, in the country. And so personally, I want to thank Dick and Betty and the alums because I certainly benefited from meeting these folks. Uh, <coughs> and, and so it was really great, especially since as a legal historian, I know the constitutional history of this, it was the military history that scared me. And so every year they were very generous in terms of explaining things to me. So tonight, we are delighted to have Dr. Caroline Janey. She is, I think all of you know, the 2022 recipient of the Lincoln Prize. I cannot express to you how prestigious this award is. It is the top award in the country for anybody doing any scholarship and writing about the Civil War and Reconstruction. Now, in thinking about what to say about her, I, I thought, you know, she was born. She was born for the job that she now holds. She holds the uh, um, professor now, uh, chair of Civil War history, director of the now Center for Civil War history at UVA. Why do I say she was born for it? A grandfather who took her to Civil War battlefields, Antietam and Gettysburg. Now, she didn't know that she wanted to be a Civil War historian initially. In fact, she thought she might go to law school. Uh, but she saw the light before that happened. And she saw the light because she was an undergrad at UVA, and she set her under some extraordinary people, Ed Ayers, and, um, so when she did decide to come back as a graduate student, Gary Gallagher was there to be her dissertation advisor. I think all of you know that recently in terms of analyzing Confederate memorials, it has come out recently that these memorials were financed by women who raised private funds, you know, daughters of the, that's not the correct title, but daughters of the, the Confederacy who raised the funds for the memorial. Well, um, Professor Janey was doing this decades ago, as youthful as she is. She, she knew about these memorials decades ago. So in any event, what we're seeing tonight, though, is Lee's army, as you know, after Appomattox. There is a myth that is a popular misconception that, oh, Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox in April of 1865. Somehow, miraculously, the Civil War is over. No, and that's why her book says ends of. It's, it, yes, it's a hugely important thing, but then a few weeks later, Lincoln is assassinated. So it's an extraordinary, chaotic moment in time that she has tweaked out. What, what did this mean for those soldiers leaving Appomattox? So anyway. Without further ado, because I know you want to hear more from her, Professor Janey, would you take the lectern? Thank you. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Barbara, for that extraordinary introduction. Thank you for the invitation and to the history department for being so kind and so welcoming. I spent the first 12 years of my career at, uh, at Purdue in the Midwest, and so I feel um, like I'm coming home a bit to come back to, to this part of the country. I, a big thank you to the Smiths. I am deeply honored to be here tonight, and it has been my sincere pleasure to meet your family, to meet your children and grandchildren, and to, to meet so many of your former students. So this is uh, incredibly humbling to be here tonight. So without further ado, I'm gonna start where Barbara left us. Am I echoing in the micro microphone or all good? Okay, so I wanna start at Appomattox and a scene that should be familiar perhaps to many of you, a scene that has been etched in our American myth and memory as the end of the most important, certainly the bloodiest war in American history. 
And I think many of us, myself included, use Appomattox as the shorthand when we talk about the end of the Civil War. We say that name of that small village, and we all know what we're talking about. That it was that moment that ended things. But I want to tell a different story tonight. Because what happened in McLean's parlor on April 9, 1865, was the surrender of a single Confederate army. It was not a blueprint of what to do with tens of thousands of former Confederates. It was not a peace treaty. There was never a peace treaty in the American Civil War. To have done so would have been to have recognized the Confederacy as a legitimate nation. So Lincoln and others would not, could not, offer a peace treaty. Instead, in the days and weeks and months that followed April 9, 1865, many of the unanticipated results of disbanding rebel forces became issues for the United States government, but for so many others as well, for local communities, both in Virginia and well beyond the Commonwealth, for black and white, north and south, loyal and rebel. But in order to understand that story, we need to slow down time. We need to quit jumping ahead to what we know comes next. Take each day, day by day. But we do need to start here in Wilmer McLean's parlor with those terms that Ulysses S. Grant offered to Robert E. Lee. The first term was a common term in any surrender, and that is that the soldiers would lay down their weapons and surrender themselves. But, as at Vicksburg, Grant had decided that he would allow the Confederates to go home as paroled prisoners of war. In other words, he was not going to send them to a prisoner of war camp. I think we too often forget that that was not a very practical option, but it was, in fact, an option. But what Grant did at Appomattox was to add a provision that had not been in any other surrender, and one that would prove controversial from the very moment that he issued it. That is, paroled Confederates were not to be disturbed by U.S. authorities so long as they maintained good behavior. In other words, so long as they didn't break any laws. By including this provision that we often take for granted, we need to know that Grant had tacitly acknowledged that Lee's soldiers were enemy combatants who could not be tried as traitors. You can't try an enemy combatant as a traitor once they have surrendered. So these are the terms. They agree upon these terms, but this isn't the end of the story. Both Grant and Lee will appoint three officers as commissioners, and they're to come up with the individual terms of what's going to happen. Who's included in the terms? How far do they extend? You've got the three con Confederates here at the bottom, the three Union soldiers here at the top, and I don't expect you to be able to read this. I'm just, as a historian, offering you my evidence to show you what, what happens here. And so those six men are going to spend April 10th discussing how these terms are going to play out. One of those is going to be that there will, in fact, be a surrender ceremony, a surrender parade, if you will. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Part of what's going to happen, though, is in a surrender, you need an accounting of who has surrendered themselves. And so there are lists that are created of every man who has been surrendered. Any of you that might be interested in Civil War history might have looked at the compiled service records and you find a list of men who served in, in every regiment, Confederate regiments you can find if they, or if they were surrendered at Appomattox. This all comes from those lists that are created that are including all the men who have in fact been surrendered. Lee and Grant would meet again on the morning of April 10th and that morning, Lee had another concern. He was worried that if, in fact, his men were going to be sent home as paroled prisoners of war, that they would need some sort of proof so that when they encountered a Union officer along the way, that they would have evidence that they were, in fact, a paroled prisoner of war. General Gibbon, one of the commissioners, one of the corps commanders in the Army of the Potomac, says, hey, guess what? I have a printing press with me, very practical. 
And so they produced these parole passes that are passes handed out to the men, sometimes at Appomattox, sometimes days later, that are to serve as evidence that they are, in fact, paroled prisoners of war. Following this, uh, the, the cavalry and artillery are going to be sent away on the, the 10th and 11th of April. They have horses. The horses are starving as much as the men are. The notion is get the horses away as quickly as, as possible. But again, unlike the surrender that Grant had overseen at Vicksburg in July of 1863, he's going to demand a formal surrender parade. The parade happens at Appomattox on April 12th with just the infantry. There's only a small portion of the Union Army that's left to oversee this. The men will walk up, they will stack their, their rifles, they're supposed to leave their regimental flags, but there are lots of stories of men who have wrapped them around their bodies in order to take them home. Uh, but this is the final surrender parade of the Army of Northern Virginia. With this done, the men begin to make their way home. Many of them walked, some as companies, some as regiments, some as entire brigades. I found evidence of more than a thousand men marching away from Appomattox towards southwestern Virginia and Tennessee. This isn't the, the vision that we get from Gone with the Wind or otherwise of one or two men straggling away. They're marching away from Appomattox. They're from Virginia. They might make it home within a matter of days. Otherwise, they might need to take up one of the other provisions that Grant had offered on the morning of April 10th, Special Orders 173, in which they could use this parole pass in order to get rations or to get transportation on U.S.-run steamers and railroads. So these are stamps where men have shown up presented themselves as surrendered prisoners of war. They're allowed to use the, the government-run railroads. They're allowed to get provisions. And some of these men will need to travel as far as Texas. The Texas Brigade, part of the Army in Northern Virginia. Again, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is a man from the 4th Texas who's making his way home. And the signatures along the way will document his stops in New Orleans, his stops in Galveston. So using those government steamers to make his way home. He won't make it home until mid-June. So April 9th to mid-June, this trip home can take quite a while. But one of the more interesting things that I found in doing my research was a numbers game. And I'm not a mathematician, so I'm going to do some very rough math here. I think it's suitable. It's not great math, but I want you to bear with me. So, of the 60,000 men that Lee had available to him when he evacuated the trenches of Petersburg and Richmond in early April, so of the 60,000 men, only 26,000 to 28,000 would surrender themselves at Appomattox. If we account for the approximately 11,500 casualties that took place between April 2nd and April 8th during that campaign, a conservative estimate would suggest that at least 20,000 men were missing. 20,000 men who should have surrendered with Lee at Appomattox were not there. Why? Well, I believe their reasons were as varied as the men themselves, Many were foot sore and starving stragglers struggling to keep up with the unrelenting pace of Lee's army as it pressed ever westward, looking for that connection south to meet up with Joe Johnston's army in North Carolina. Others believed there was little use in resisting anymore and elected simply to go home. Some decided that the humiliation of surrendering would be just too much. And when they learned that, that Lee would in fact surrender, they took to the hills, took to the valleys of the Appomattox River and rode away vowing never to surrender. At least some of them had planned that in fact they would avoid a surrender if they could and that was members of the cavalry. I love these maps, I will do my, my usual um, uh, free ad that I do for the American Battlefield Trust. I think it's a great organization. If you can support it, do so. They make wonderful maps of not just the Civil War, but the American Revolution as well. Up here, we have Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry, 
some more cavalry down here. Fitzhugh Lee was Robert E. Lee's um, nephew. They had agreed before there actually was a battle at Appomattox Courthouse on the morning of, of April 9th that if it was just infantry in front of them, if they could get past them, they would. Somewhere around 2,000 cavalry members are able to escape the Union Cordon on April 9th. They ride west toward Lynchburg, Virginia, where they will reconvene. When they get there, cavalry officers such as Major General Thomas Rosser and Colonel Thomas uh, Munford will, will meet and they will try to decide what their options are. They've managed to break past the surrender lines, but are they going to head south and meet up with Joe Johnston? Are they going to take the, the war to the mountains and valleys of the Shenandoah Valley? Well, on April 12th, you'll remember that is the day that the formal parade is taking place, the infantry is laying down their guns and flags. That very same day, Thomas Rosser would ride to Stanton, Virginia, which is over in the Shenandoah Valley, where he would issue a proclamation from what he declared to be the headquarters of the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, I hope you just heard that. The Army of Northern Virginia is busy surrendering, and he is going to uh, issue a proclamation at the very top there. It says, Headquarters, Army of Northern Virginia. April 12th. He's also going to give himself a nice promotion. He's now a lieutenant general, no longer a major general. With Lee out of the picture, he can promote himself as he long thought he should have been. But here's what he has to say here. He calls on his men to shoulder their muskets once more and return to the field to meet the arrogant invader who had insulted you, robbed you, murdered your dearest friends and relatives, outraged your fair women despoiled your homes and dishonored all that is most dear and sacred. He said he would lead his men once more against this dastardly foe and promised he would never surrender until, quote, the purple current ceases to flow from my heart or until you are a free, independent, and happy people. Rise like men and come to me, he commanded. That's all here. I trust that you can all read that very clearly. <laughs> This is on April 12th. He tells them to come to other locations throughout Virginia, to Charlottesville, to Lynchburg, to Stanton. And he says, the cavalry is going to ride once more. In other words, the war for these men is not yet over. The surrender has happened at Appomattox, but this war is not yet over. Some of these men would go home and await this rallying call with plans to meet at these locations. Others decided to immediately head south to North Carolina, where they hoped to join the army of Joe Johnston. In other words, Appomattox presents a great irony. It was and continues to be seen as the end of Lee's army and, by extension, the end of the war. But a significant portion of Lee's army was not there to surrender. Did that mean that the war was, in fact, over? Did it mean that Lee's army was in fact over? Well, this man certainly had thoughts about this. This is Ulysses S. Grant. On April 10th, after he's met with Lee for that last time, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton would, would uh, telegraph Grant and ask if the troops that were operating in northern and eastern Virginia were to be included in the surrender terms he had just negotiated or only those, quote, operating under Lee's immediate personal command. Well, Grant would, would write back and he would say, well, technically the terms only apply to those who were under Lee's personal command, but I think they should be applied to all fragments of the Army of Northern Virginia to convince them to surrender. You see, this is what is most important to Grant. Grant believes that every single Confederate must surrender or this war won't be over. One of the things I think we discount is this palpable fear of guerrilla warfare. It didn't happen, so we don't talk about it. But Grant and Sherman and others, in their private letters to their wives and in official correspondence, are worried about those 20,000 plus men. And I should point out, Grant knows that these men are missing. They, they, they know the numbers well enough to know that there is a significant portion that's not there. And so Grant tells all of his subordinates, 
and tells the War Department, let's extend the same terms that I've extended at Appomattox to any man who is willing to come in and surrender himself. It's a pragmatic, practical, yes, Grant is magnanimous, but he's also being very practical and calculating in his desire to end the war. He also knows that paroling is a deterrent. He believes that paroled soldiers are more honorable, more trustworthy than unparoled civilians who are out there hiding in the mountains and valleys. And so when I I found this, I began tracing all of these other paroles that are happening. happening. I, I, I did most of my research at the National Archives, going through the records Um, RG-393, for anyone who has has done any work in the National Archives, which are are voluminous. And I realized that there were all these paroles for places beyond Appomattox. And what I quickly found is thousands upon thousands of Lee's men were paroled at sites well beyond Appomattox. A few examples. So right here, sort of mid-center, we have Appomattox, spelled incorrectly. Remember all those cavalrymen who have headed toward Lynchburg? In the three days after the surrender at Appomattox, at least, at least 2,800 Confederates are paroled in Lynchburg. The great story there is the provost marshal's office, the Confederate provost marshal's office that had been on a central street in Lynchburg. They hightail it out of Lynchburg when they realize the Union Army is on its way. And the Union Army gets there and says, oh, a provost marshal's office. And so they put their great big United States flag across the street, and they use the very same provost marshal's office that had enlisted Confederate soldiers to parole Confederate soldiers. Just to the southeast, here this is a place called Burkeville Junction. It is the, the closest open railroad line, the South Side Railroad, which will make its way over toward Petersburg. Lots of Lee's men start coming into Burkeville Junction. Remember those parole passes? What do those parole passes let them do? I'm talking to you students. What do those parole passes let them do? Give them, give them uh, train tickets. They, they let them ride on the trains. So they can get rations there. Great job. They get rations there, and now they can, can ride on the train. They don't have to walk. So we find thousands coming into places like Burkeville Junction in the days after Appomattox. It's not just around Appomattox that this is happening. Up in Winchester, Virginia, I think, Ms. Smith, this might be a familiar territory for you. (laughs) Winchester, Virginia, represented in the audience tonight. Uh, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock is in charge of the military district here. And he gets word from Washington that, in fact, Lee has surrendered, and he's ordered by Secretary Stanton to publish the correspondence, the exchange of letters that had gone back and forth between Lee and Grant. We can use the term negotiating the surrender, but discussing the surrender. Stanton, the Secretary of War, tells Hancock to post these throughout Winchester to make sure that people know that Lee has, in fact, surrendered. And so he does this, but he also puts an ad in the newspaper And this ad says, Lee has surrendered. I know you don't believe this is the case, but he has surrendered. And you are welcome to come in and get paroled on the very same terms, those very same generous terms as at Appomattox, if you would like to do so. But he offers a warning, and he offers this warning to women in particular, women in particular who have been harboring some of those men who have fled to the valley to hide out. And he says, every military restraint shall be removed that is not absolutely essential. And your sons, your husbands, and your brothers shall remain with you unmolested if they are paroled. And then he offers the threat. They can come in and get paroled, and if they don't, they will be arrested as prisoners and sent to northern military camps. So this is encouraging people to come in. They absolutely pour into Winchester, Virginia. And so these are some of the records that I looked at. I ended up creating a database of more than 16,000 men. Each individual name is put into an Excel spreadsheet. Looking at these men who come and turn themselves in. They will gather in small 
communities up and down the Shenandoah Valley. Hancock also will send out Union cavalry patrols looking for any men who aren't coming in voluntarily, and they, they do find a number of those as well. So we can see the parole itself actually changes. This is a parole pass from Winchester. There's a couple of things that are going on here. It looks very different than that Appomattox pass that had been printed in the field at Appomattox, um, in part because this is like a, a pass that would have been issued if you were a prisoner of war coming from someplace like uh, Fort um, uh, Point Lookout or one of the other northern prisons. It would be like this. But the other really interesting thing is these are being issued after Lincoln's assassination. And what they include that you probably can't see here is a physical description, whoops, a physical description of the individual that gives their age, their height, their hair color, their eye color. So this is a period before we have photo IDs. And this is a way for men to prove that they are who they say they are. So we can see how the, the terms and even the, the proof that's needed is going to change in the wake of Lincoln's assassination. So they're streaming into towns in the Shenandoah Valley. They're throughout south side of Virginia. They're also flooding into the former Confederate capital, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, they're mingling with the Union soldiers that are already there as this image right in front of the, the State House will show. And this is a, a photograph that um, was recently pointed out to me. This is the former uh, White House of the Confederacy. And we know that just off screen to the right was a provost marshal's office. And when you zoom in, you can see that these are all Confederate soldiers. Likely, I don't have definitive proof, but likely they're waiting to receive their paroles. Among those might have been this man, Spencer Waring, who should have been at Appomattox. His, most of his unit was paroled at Appomattox, but he had managed to escape for whatever reason and by whatever means, but makes his way to the former capital of the Confederacy by April 25th, where he would receive his parole. So I took all of those numbers, 16,000 men in the database, and plotted it on a map, and I get something like this that shows the paroles that happened at places beyond Appomattox. So we can see this process of ending the war doesn't just happen at Appomattox. It happens everywhere. And it's not just Grant being magnanimous. This is a practical, pragmatic way to end a civil war. How do you end a civil war? This is one of the ways you do so. I give Grant a lot of credit, but he had not and he could not have accounted for a host of social, political, and legal questions that followed the surrender. I take up several of these in the book, but this evening I just want to talk about two of those questions, those unanticipated questions that Grant and others in the, the Union High Command and in Washington, D.C. had to deal with. The first, would rebel soldiers, paroled or not, be allowed to pass through loyal Union territory on their way home? Would Confederates be allowed to pass through the loyal Union territory on their way home? Well, this is not something that Grant had considered at Appomattox. If you're sending soldiers home to North Carolina and Tennessee, in Texas and Virginia, you expect them to go home directly to those states. But within a week of Lee's surrender, large numbers of paroled prisoners began steaming into Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland, and even, as this uh, woodcut would suggest, into New York City. Many of them requesting free transportation to homes in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. Grant starts hearing from his commanders at all of these places. Um, one of them is Lou Wallace, who is in Baltimore. And especially in the wake of Lincoln's assassination, Lou Wallace is unhinged. We'll come back, talk more about Lou Wallace in a few minutes. And he's telling Grant that these men are sailing into Baltimore Harbor every day. There's more gray coming in to Baltimore Harbor than there is blue. 
And so Grant will write back to him and have this to say. It was no part of the agreement that we were to transport or feed paroled prisoners. Well, actually, he did say they would do that. By the terms of the surrender, they were allowed to return to their homes, and I ordered that their parole should be a pass to go through our lines when it was necessary to do so to reach their homes, and that when they traveled on roads or boats run exclusively by the government, no fare would be collected. I did not calculate that men from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia would expect to go home by way of New York. <laughs> Why should he? But they are. Well, I can tell you why. It doesn't make much sense, but we know why from a group of Confederate soldiers from Tennessee who write to Lee on April 23rd telling him that they have been confined. They've been confined here at Fortress Monroe. So what you are looking at, this is the Chesapeake Bay. This is a close-up of the Chesapeake Bay. This is the James River that will go up to Richmond. Right here is Fortress Monroe. You might be familiar with Fortress Monroe. This is where the first three enslaved men in May of 1861 would make their way to Benjamin Butler and declare themselves or ask to be protected by the United States Army. Um, and the Fugitive Slave Act no longer uh, protecting Confederates because the Confederate, the Virginia has left the Union. So anyway, they, they go to Fortress Monroe. They think that they're going to be able to get a steamer and they are denied. Not only are they denied, they are hauled into one of the, the cells in Fortress Monroe, and they've been held there. And so their only recourse, they say, is to write to Lee. They write to Lee on April 23rd, as I mentioned, and Lee is absolutely incensed because they've told him that they were, in fact, on their speediest and most direct route home, which looks like this. So right down here is Fortress Monroe. Remember, they're going to Tennessee. That's not the most direct route home. There's mountains right there. Those are mountains. So what they're going to do is they're going to sail up to Baltimore. From Baltimore, they're going to get on the B&O and head west over here, go south to Louisville, down to Nashville. Speediest and most direct route home is to take a government steamer and railroads to make their way home. But they have been stopped. They also tell Lee they had no money. They had no money to purchase tickets, to go any other way. They cannot change their clothing. They have to be wearing their Confederate uniforms, and so they're asking for help. Lee, as I mentioned, is incensed, and he picks up his pen and writes to Ulysses S. Grant. And he tells him that he's heard of many such cases. And he also understands that Army of Northern Virginia soldiers are now being forced to take an oath of allegiance to the United States to make their way home. And he said that was not part of the agreement on April 9th. That's not what the terms of surrender said. There's a lot to this story, but the short version is by May 1st, Grant will order the, the Union officers in charge of Fortress Monroe to send those men home just to get rid of them. But he says, do not let any more in. We cannot keep doing this. It's not just Fortress Monroe that this is happening. Within the Union lines in Alexandria and Fairfax, Virginia, so right outside of Washington, D.C., this has been occupied by Union forces since the very first weeks and months of the war. And soldiers from that region who are returning home will find that they have to do things like this that doesn't show up real well, but this is uh, men uh, turning themselves over to the local provost marshal. So they have to go, and even though they've been paroled, they have to go and sign in with the local provost marshal. They will also find that their names are going to be printed in the local newspaper. If you look at the Alexandria Gazette in the weeks after Appomattox, well into June of 1865, you'll find lists of names of men who are Confederates who have come home to the region, who've had to check in at the provost marshal office, and then their names are listed and there's an article that talks about this in one of the papers as a warning to all of their unionist neighbors 
that in fact these rebels are coming home. One of these men, whoops, whose name is right here, Thomas Murray. Thomas Murray had been a member of the 17th Virginia from Fairfax County. He's been paroled at Appomattox. He finds out that his father has died on his way home from Appomattox, so he's rushing home to get to his mother as quickly as possible. During his trip home, Lincoln is assassinated. And some of the men that are traveling with him, other members of the 17th Virginia, warn him that perhaps it's not safe to go into such a heavily Union-occupied part of Virginia. Maybe we should just hang out elsewhere. And Murray says, no, I, I need to get home. He goes home to see his grieving mother. He's immediately arrested by Union officials who find out that a paroled Confederate has come home. He is placed on a very bumpy cart ride to the local train station. From the train station, he is hauled to Alexandria, Virginia, where he is imprisoned here at the Bryce Birch Company, former dealer in enslaved people. He doesn't know where he is at first. He's in a room with somewhere between two and 300 other Confederates, many of them local men from the 17th Virginia and other local regiments. They begin feeling around, their eyes finally adjust to the darkness, and they realize that they are, in fact, in a slave pen. Thomas Murray's father had owned seven enslaved people in 1860, including at least some that he had purchased from this very building. Could this be any more ironic? Men who had gone to war in order to protect their interest as slaveholders, now confined in the very same pens where they had bought and traded in human flesh. This is a reminder that they are defeated, that their entire social system and economic system and everything else has been turned upside down. And it's a stark reminder that they are prisoners of war. They are not free to go as they like. Which brings me to another question. What was to be done with the approximately 75,000 men from the loyal border states, the slave states that stayed loyal to the Union of Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware? The men who fought for the Confederacy from these states. You see, it was one thing to send paroled soldiers back to states that had seceded, where the majority of the population had been in rebellion and the terms of recognizing the civil governments in those states was still up for debate. But what do you do with men who willingly left their own loyal states to go fight for the Confederacy? Should they be allowed to return home? especially in the wake of Lincoln's assassination? Remember, Booth is a Marylander. Maybe this war isn't over yet. Well, as early as April 12th, so before the assassination, Union officers had begun expressing concern about Confederates who wanted to return to states such as Maryland. Maryland in particular, some 20,000 Marylanders had fought for the Confederate armies. And as I've already mentioned, every day many of them are returning to Maryland, including into Baltimore. Only days after the surrender, one Union officer had asked Grant whether all the soldiers paroled by Lee's surrender might have to report to Provost Marshall's offices. Again, that hadn't been part of the April 9th discussion or even the April 10th discussions. But he wants a list of names of rebels who are coming back into Maryland. Let's have an accounting of those who are coming home. But Lincoln's assassination on Friday, April 14th, by again, a Baltimore native and famed actor John Wilkes Booth only heightened the problem. Baltimore was immediately placed under martial law. All the rebels in the cities were to report to the provost marshal, their papers were to be examined, 
and only those who could prove that their former residences lay within the city boundaries would be allowed to remain. All the others would be forced to leave immediately. They would all be forced to discard their Confederate uniforms within 12 hours of arriving in the city. Well, in the days and weeks that followed, both Grant and Attorney General James Speed would offer opinions or, or military orders that modified those April 9th surrender terms. And I think it's imperative, we have to keep the military history in mind here. We can never understand the social and political without understanding the military and vice versa. The largest of the Confederate armies is still in the field. Joe Johnston has not surrendered yet. He's down in, in Durham, North Carolina. Kirby Smith is west of the Mississippi River. There is still potentially a Confederate military threat out there. And so on April 22nd, Attorney General James Speed would respond to an inquiry from Secretary of War Stanton, who had been incensed by the number of former Confederates coming into Washington, coming into the Union capital of all places. And he, Stanton had asked Speed for his opinion on the surrender terms that Grant had given Lee. So Stanton, who's very upset at the surrender terms that Sherman is in the process of offering to, to Johnston, he asks the Attorney General to look over Grant's surrender terms, ask him to offer a legal opinion on those terms. And Speed has this to say. He says, rebel officers and soldiers who appear in public in their uniform are violating their paroles. Again, that had not been part of the April 9th discussions. Like Grant, Speed declared that rebels had no homes in loyal states. They had forfeited those homes when they left their states to fight for the Confederacy. He said they could not return, and he specifies exactly which states he means, to Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, or Missouri without taking an oath of allegiance to the United States. And even though that might seem like a simple thing, most of these men were not willing to do that. Well, Back in Baltimore, our friend General Lou Wallace, who is a Republican, he's a, a political general, if you will, very much a Republican. He is so excited by this order. And I should point out that, that Grant will take the opinion from Speed and make it a military order. So all Union officers are to enforce it. Wallace wastes no time making sure that this is implemented. He orders that all the Confederates in the city are rounded up and he actually wants them sent south of the Potomac River, back into Confederate territory. He issues a circular appealing for information from, quote, loyal citizens in ferreting out offenders. In other words, this isn't just a problem playing out among the Union High Command or among the executive. This is something that's affecting loyal civilian populations as well. On April 24th, the Baltimore City Council would formally protest the return of any rebels, quote, believing as we do, their presence in our midst will be a constant source of irritation, fraught with the deadliest mischief. It's not just in Baltimore that this is happening. In Frederick, Maryland, in Carroll County, indeed in counties that are marked with the, the diagonal lines there across Maryland, communities are going to get together and they're going to form committees, committees of vigilance and safety. You might hear the Revolutionary War rhetoric there, that are to look for and to prevent any rebels from returning to their counties. This isn't enough. On April 26th, Benjamin Harris, a citizen of Maryland and a Democratic member of Congress, would be arrested for giving money to two paroled Army of Northern Virginia soldiers encouraging them to discard their paroles and to continue making war on the United States. A sitting U.S. congressman has done this. And in May, Shepherdstown, West Virginia, which sits right on the Potomac River, across from, from Maryland, Henry Kidd Douglas, who lived literally on the other side of the river, his house, sat on the, the Maryland side of the Potomac River, um, shows up in Shepherdstown wearing his Confederate uniform. Guess what? He is arrested. He is tried 
by a military commission for violating his parole, and he is sent off to Fort Delaware for an unnamed period of time. This hardly looks like things are over. Indeed, Speed and Grant's rulings had, not rulings, but opinions and directives had applied to those states that had been loyal to the Union. But what do you do about West Virginia? A state that had been part of Virginia and had seceded from Virginia when Virginia seceded from the Union, there, Speed and Grant's rules don't apply. They said Confederates could return to West Virginia. And West Virginians were particularly loyal West Virginians were particularly stung by this. There are approximately 18,000 Confederates who served from the region that would become part of West Virginia. And they found this not just offensive, but this was a real political threat. If these men returned home, they could potentially vote to overturn West Virginia statehood. Again, something we take for granted, there were in fact Supreme Court cases testing whether or not West Virginia could become its own state. And they're worried about the fact that maybe these 18,000 Confederates come back and West Virginia reverts to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Men who have been actively trying to destroy the state will come back home to it. Well, they do the same thing that happens in Maryland. I was able to find 12 of these vigilance and safety committees. I actually think there are probably more out there. These are just the ones I was able to, to identify. And they're passing resolutions in the local newspapers barring Confederates from coming home, but it's more than just resolutions. In Marion County, when reports surfaced in Marion is right here, when reports surfaced that two Confederate soldiers had returned to their mother's home, the local home guard showed up and asked the mother if, in fact, her Confederate sons had returned home. She said, no, they're not here. But they heard scuffling up in the woods behind them. And so the home guard goes out searching. Lo and behold, there are the two rebels who have returned to the county. A gunfight ensues. One of the brothers is seriously wounded, and the other is killed. Is this the end of the war? Well, ending the war would mean a host of new realities for the entire nation, but perhaps for none more so than the approximately four million African Americans who had been enslaved. In 1861, one out of every 20 to 30 Confederate soldiers had brought an enslaved man with him to manage his gear, to cook his meals, to mend and wash his clothing, to tend his horses. Over the course of the war, the number and percentage of these so-called body servants declined, even as the Confederate government impressed more and more free and enslaved black men and women into labor on behalf of the Confederate army. So by Appomattox, hundreds Hundreds of black men, both enslaved and free, remained with Lee's army. We know about some of them because they were listed on the parole records. They're listed as teamsters or cooks or otherwise. But we also know about some of them because Confederate soldiers wrote home about them. For example, John Crawford Anderson of the 13th South Carolina wrote home from his tent at Appomattox to his father that his valet and cook Peter, quote, still proves true and says he will never desert the cause, but is very much elated at the idea of getting home. I think we can hear the foreshadowings of the so-called faithful slave line that, that the lost cause would promote increasingly over the course of the 19th century. We have no record of Peter's emotions. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have some sense of what Peter thought? I'm sure he did want to get home. I'm sure he did want to get home to his family as well. We don't have any record of his emotions, but it's likely that he thought of April 9, 1865 as Freedom Day, as the way so many African Americans who were there did. 
One of those men was William H. Harrison. We don't have a photograph of William H. Harrison, but he was a member of the United States Colored Troops who was in the field across from Lee's army there on April 9th. Harrison had been born in Richmond, Virginia, and had been forced to accompany his owner to war with Lee's army as a body servant until he was captured in 1863 by the United States Army and forced into service as a United States color troop. But from the Union ranks at Appomattox, he would proudly proclaim his role in destroying slavery. I was with General Grant when Lee surrendered at Appomattox, he wrote. That was freedom. Indeed, that was probably the experience of so many of these men. But for the black men who had labored with the Confederate military, they had to figure out how they would get home. Many of them faced the same daunting tasks as their former enslavers in making their ways back to their loved ones. Some of them had decisions to make. Would they travel with their former owners back to their families and their homes, or would they strike out on their own? We know stories of men who, who did both. But for the men who chose to stay with their enslavers, they likely did so because it was the safest option for them to do so. Appomattox had not ended slavery, and it certainly hadn't gotten rid of the violence that had undergirded the system of slavery to begin with. The fear and terror remained. And there are so many accounts along the way of Confederates making their way home and encountering United States colored troops. Many of them talk about simply being insulted that they have to check in with a black soldier. Others are incredibly insulted that their buttons and their rank of insignia are cut off by black soldiers. And some would brag years later that they had used violence to respond to this. A group of soldiers from Florida were traveling home, bragged they killed not one, but three different United States Colored Troop soldiers on their way home. Indeed, if we look at the military commission trials across the former Confederacy in the summer of 1865, there are numerous instances of both Confederate soldiers and local white civilians killing USCT soldiers. The presence of black men in uniforms was perhaps more humiliating and more of a sign of defeat than the surrender at Appomattox had been. There is much, much more to this story, but I'd like to leave you with this. Rather than serving as a clear ending to the American Civil War, the surrender of Lee's army brought into stark relief many of the legal, social, and political questions that had plagued the war from its very beginning. Perhaps most important, there had never been a golden moment, a moment when Lee's men were so thoroughly defeated that they were willing to accept any terms. If anything, the humiliation of registering at Provost Marshal's offices, the perils faced by border region Confederates, the struggles to return home, and the presence of both white and black Union occupying troops emboldened their claims of Southern righteousness and Northern barbarity. You see, the disbanding of the Army of, the Northern, of Northern Virginia had not marked the end of the nation's division. It was only the beginning, foreshadowing much of what would play out in the decades to come. Thank you. I think we have time for a few questions. Yes, we do. I'm the, the carrier of the microphone. So. So the, the question, I'll repeat his question. The question is, did Grant allow soldiers to keep their arms? He allowed officers 
to keep their arms, but not enlisted men. You know, which was a convention, uh, a European military convention. The same thing happens at Yorktown. So officers, I, and you know, there, there's all of the, um, you know, the legends and whatnot that grew up around Appomattox. It is true that, they, that Lee took his sword and prepared to offer it to Grant, and Grant declined that. But officers were allowed to keep their, their sidearms. They're allowed to keep. Which actually proved to be very important, because remember I said these men, many of them, especially to North Carolina and the Texas Brigade, they leave as companies and regiments and brigades, and the officers are talking about having to keep these men in line as they go. And so having their sidearms you know, is, is an important part of that. Yes? More questions? Um, so you mentioned how the, uh, they sort of had to improvise those passes for the paroled soldiers, um, and some of them had special permissions to use rail. Um, how exactly would they like communicate to other Union troops that they should expect these things to be presented? Um, because from what it sounds like, it was a very sort of in-the-moment decision to make this sort of system of passes to get home. Yeah, it's a great question. The, those passes had been something that paroled prisoners of war coming from, a, say, a northern prison camp would have had. They would have looked more like those ones I showed you from Winchester than the ones produced in the field. And so the notion of parole passes, something that both sides use. So the Confederates are going to print those for paroled Union POWs as well. And so people are, are quite used to the pass system during the war. They're, they, and that you need passes for everything. You need passes to, to travel through different territory. Uh, there's a senator from Texas, Senator Wigfall, who complains that, that he feels like he's being treated like a slave because he needs a pass to, to travel different places. So the, the pass system itself would have been something that was expected. But the, with the, the telegraph, you know, these commands are, are, are communicating very rapidly with one another. What is happening, though, is people, commanders, are making decisions at the local level depending on the local circumstances. So decisions that are being made, say, in Norfolk, Virginia, might look very different than in, in Charlestown, West Virginia, in terms of the local circumstances. But they are very aware, aware that these parole passes are something that, that's out there. Great question. I wondered about food and provisions and how that system worked effectively since theoretically there wasn't much foraging available in some of these areas. And especially if you've got a large group of people, how were they even feasibly able to manage that? Right. A lot of different ways that they're trying to find food. Um, one of the, the problems of keeping these large groups together one of the reasons that many of the brigades ultimately break up, they'll stay together for, on average, three to four days, and the brigade commander will realize that he can't provision his men and that it's easier if they strike out in pairs of three or four at a time. But I follow lots of these different stories along the way of, of men trying to find not just food but shelter for the evening, and they're relying in large part upon Civilians, both civilians who are willingly supplying food and those who are not. Uh, there's, there's one soldier who keeps a diary and he lists everyone by name of who gives him food and who doesn't. As a kind of a reminder for future, they are, are, are taking things from enslaved people. They, they talk about this. They also know where the local commissary depots are. And so they're making their ways to places like Danville, Virginia, or to Greensboro, North Carolina, or over toward what's now Roanoke, Virginia. They know that the, the Confederate commissary has provisions there, and so they go and they raid them. And this happens in, in Danville, it happens in Greensboro, it happens in Charlotte. And what's really fascinating is the, the local community will say, I mean, they're raiding these, these warehouses, and they're taking anything that they can find. They're taking food, they're taking molasses, they're taking alcohol, they're taking pants and shoes, whatever they can, can get their hands on. And the local communities will say, 
we don't have a problem with them taking these things because they belong to them. They belong to the Confederate Army, but we draw the line at private property. And so when they start ransacking small business, local businesses, that's where it becomes problematic. But you know, there's, there's all sorts of amazing stories. They're, they're all heading for mills. They know where the local grist mill is. And so they, they are, are heading for those territories. They're also the geography of Virginia and where Appomattox is, the portion, if you head due south, except for commissary agents, had been virtually untouched. So one of the things I was really surprised to find are all of these Confederates on the home front who are quite willing to supply them with what sound like feasts when these men come through because they absolutely still see them as their heroes and their defenders. And you know the, the myth of the lost cause, the notion of they weren't defeated, they were overwhelmed by superior northern material and manpower. You know, it's, it's part myth, but, but that belief is there in April of 1865, that these men haven't been defeated and we, we owe it to them to feed them, to clothe them, to do as much as we can. But there are plenty who, who resist it as well, and their names have been documented by some soldier. The fourth or fifth uh, slide in your slide deck showed a very orderly line of people uh, turning in their arms at Appomattox. Mm -hmm. It struck me as being rather similar to her, uh, the funeral for Her Majesty the Queen uh -huh. being planned for 50 years. However, this was obviously more on the fly. My question is this, was it really in fact orderly or was, in, in view of the fact that 20 or 20,000 or so skedaddled, um, was it done right? This, the surrender parade absolutely was that orderly. You only have um, one um, a remnant of one Union Corps there. This is why Chamberlain of Killer Angel and Gettysburg fame, you know, Chamberlain is, is the commanding officer who's there. That's why he, he writes about it. He also lives a very long time, so he gets to say the last word. But it is a very orderly um, procession. And you know, the Confederates are talking about this. They describe it as their funeral. There's lots of diaries who talk about this as the funeral parade. And it's a very dreary day. Um, it's the, the emotions apparently ran high on both sides. But most of the, most of the um, Union Army, both the Army of the James and the Army of the Potomac, are gone. And the cavalry and artillery are gone at this point. But those that, that remain, it is. It is, it is, you know, it's, it's a military procession. It's, it's part of the ritual of ending it. In Winchester, uh, General Hancock had the, offered the parole, but also provided the warning. Were there very many apprehended who didn't get paroled, and what happened to them? So there are a handful of people that are, in fact, rounded up, including one general who had been convalescing and had missed Appomattox. He, had, he, he wasn't supposed to have been in Appomattox. He'd been wounded and was, was back at his home. Not too far, he was actually in Fauquier County, so not too far from Winchester. And he claims that he was on his way in and hadn't made it yet, but all the locals were reporting that he was at his home. So he is arrested and sent to the old Capitol prison in, in uh, Washington. And there are others who are, but for the most part, it seems pretty, um, pretty effective at having men. So, so the, you know, a small contingent of Union cavalry would ride into these small towns up and down the Shenandoah Valley, and they'd be there for one or two days, and they would get, you know, upward of 800, 900 parolees. So word had gotten out, and these these men are, are making their way there. Uh, but there are still plenty who never get paroled. And the Confederate Veteran is a magazine that is published by the United Confederate Veterans and then with help of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and other groups starting in 1893. It runs through the 1930s. And I found countless stories of men who bragged about having never been surrendered and never paroled. And in fact, when I go back and check and look for their compiled service record, it seems that perhaps that's, that's the truth. So if they could hold out, see this is where we have to slow down the story. If they could hold out through the summer of 1865, once Andrew Johnson issues his May 29th um, amnesty proclamation that if you're a rank and file soldier and you take the oath of allegiance, then you're gonna be absolved anyway. 
but there's then there's the question of whether or not the paroles are going to hold, and so I, I, I go into all of this in the book, whether or not those paroles actually protect them from any criminal prosecution or, or prosecution for treason, and this is certainly the case for, for Lee and others. But for the, the rank and file, if they didn't get paroled in the big picture, it doesn't matter. Big picture. But we know that now. They didn't know that necessarily in May of 65. Oh, sorry, Trey. Uh, you mentioned that Sherman is kind of working on surrender terms at this time as well. Uh, is he getting word from either Grant or from Stanton about, hey, we have all these problems, you know, we're looking for you to maybe implement some changes to improve the surrender terms? No, is the answer to that. But what he is learning is, I mean, he knows that, that Grant has surrendered and he knows what the terms of surrender are. But also Confederates that are, are heading south are coming through his lines. And so he's getting reports both, um, you know, from his, his men on the front lines and others about the paroled Confederates and, and knowing some of these problems of getting food. And he knows what's happened in Danville, Virginia and otherwise. But the short version of the story is that Sherman is going to take it upon himself to delve into political issues in the surrender, recognizing state governments, in part because he thinks that's what Lincoln was heading toward before Lincoln is assassinated. And when his original surrender terms get back to Stanton, Stanton's head explodes. <laughs> and he, he writes um, op-eds that, that show up in the New York newspapers accusing Sherman of treason. And he sends Grant back down, not back down, but down to North Carolina to oversee Sherman. Grant refuses to be part of the surrender. He respects Sherman enough to say, you're going to go deal with this, but, but you, are, you are confined to these terms. And yet, the terms that Sherman gives are slightly different than the terms of Appomattox, in part because of everything that's happened between April 9th and April 26th. So yes and no. The animosity between Stanton and Sherman is such that when the Grand Review takes place, May 23rd, um, 1865, the second day will be Sherman's army marching through, and Sherman will refuse to stop and talk to the Secretary of War because he's been slandered in the Northern papers by him. That rift is never, never healed. Um, uh, one of the things I found fascinating in terms of saying is that Lee was upset about how some of the former Army of Northern Virginia soldiers were being treated because they were wearing their uniforms. Was, did I understand that correctly? Well, that's part of it. He's upset that they're being forced to take an oath of allegiance to the United States. All right. So we now project back. You know, part of the myth, as we've talked about, is that the war doesn't end with the surrender of Lee to Grant. Right? And so Grant doesn't see it as the end of the war, right? In terms of his, you know, he sees it as the beginning of the end, perhaps. Yes. But what he negotiates then is still done in wartime, right? Yes. He's not negotiating something for the reconstruction of the United States. No, he has been given strict orders by Lincoln, by Secretary of War Stanton, that he can only deal in military issues. He can only compel the surrender of Lee's army. He cannot deal in any political questions whatsoever. Now here's the other thing I'm a little confused about. Um, with how many, how many uh, men did Lee have at that moment surrendering? If, by, by the time they all show up for the dinner bell that night, yeah. <laughs> 28,231. Right. Of the 28,000, they're not all Virginians. No. That was part of the problem. But, but um, you know, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Because it sounds like the problem is not the Virginians going home into the Confederacy. The problem is Confederate soldiers showing up in Baltimore, Confederate sh soldiers showing up in Washington, D.C. So part of me, my reaction is like, duh, you thought you could go to Washington, D.C. in your Confederate uniform? You thought you could go to Baltimore in your Confederate uniform? But, but Lee, so it wasn't the uniforms, it was the Oath of Allegiance. It's the Oath of Allegiance, that, but they're also being detained. 
And that's what, so Lee is very upset that his soldiers are being detained when they say they're on their way home. But all of this is changing every single day. And the officers in Baltimore are making up rules that might be different than those in Richmond and those that are down at, at City Point and elsewhere. And so people are, I think people are doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have in that particular moment. But you're right to say, of course, why would they think they could do that? And it's twofold. Some of them are, are thinking about the transportation logistics and how that works. But they're also saying things like, um, I thought you said we were all Americans again. I thought you said this war was over. And so it's, you know, it's, it's speaking out of both sides of their mouth, that it absolutely is the case. And so it's somewhat disingenuous, but I, I do think there are, are multiple levels that go into this. And, and, and Baltimore was a very pro-Confederate city. And so going to Baltimore makes a lot of sense. Yes. I mean, it has a lot of, lot of pro-Confederate sentiment, which is why Lew Wallace is there, and he's supposed to tamp that down. So, I mean, those, those sentiments, you know, it's... it's one of the things I really wanted to do in this project was to slow down the time, put those blinders on, and pretend we don't know what happened each day, and really try to understand. This is what I say to my students all the time. We don't have to condone people's behavior in the past. We don't have to condemn people's behavior in the past. We have to try to understand why they did and made the decisions that they did with the knowledge that they had at that time. And so. That's my curiosity as a historian. And we, we can apply the same to, to today. We can ask why the Taliban or why Putin is doing what he's doing, trying to understand the, the, the frame of reference and um, the, the set of knowledge that, that people have at the time. But thank you all. This has been wonderful. I very much appreciate it.